Hey everybody, welcome to NFTs in the Arena. You're with your host Michael Savides and today we have a very special guest. I can't thank him enough for joining us. Uh, Julian Rodriguez is our, our guest today. Julian, how are you? Good, good sir. Hey Michael, good. I'm, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Cool, cool. So just a bit of a background uh, that I've prepared. So Julian is a serial entrepreneur, a product manager, as well as an innovation focused strategist. Very something that I, I look towards in, in the people that I work with. So it's very, very appealing to the people that are in this NFT space, I would imagine. So Julian has an illustrious career. And one of the things that I think will draw attention to immediately is in 2013. So very early on, Julian joined Bitcoin magazine. In 2013, I did not even know what a Bitcoin was. I was still in university. And he worked directly with, this is something very pleasing and surprising for me to find out, with Vitalik Buterin, who is essentially the guy that created Ethereum. And you can get into that and we will get into that. So obviously you've been involved in, uh, in the tech space. You've co-founded and launched venture-backed capital tech companies. And I think you've been a lifetime member of Bitcoin Foundation. Another thing that I did, was not aware about and the most recent project in which we'll also discuss today is Moment NFT, where Julian is the founder and CEO. And I have so many questions to ask Julian with a limited amount of time. So we'll try to pack it all in. And just those that are watching and listening today, Moment NFT is a direct to fan non-fungible token. NFT that allows, and co allows fans as well as collectors to own their best moments from a set, uh, from a content creator's p perspective. So Julian, welcome. Thank you for your time. So jumping straight into it, I have a question that I feel like everyone would love to know. So obviously getting into cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, Bitcoin magazine early on in 2013, I do know that was the year that the Winklevoss brothers also got into Bitcoin and we all know how that panned out. From your perspective, how did you get involved in it so early? What was your perception at the time? And did you believe that it would have the traction that it has today? Yeah. Um, so the short answer is no. I don't think anyone thought it was going to be what it is today, right? Today, it is literally like a third leg in sort of and the, <laughs> the biggest third leg in all of sort of the global economy right now, right? Um, and, I, you know, I think uh, what a lot of people forget to mention is that early on in, in, in Bitcoin, because uh, there really was no crypto, it was just Bitcoin, uh, people were really, this was the era of Occupy Wall Street, right? So we had just started coming out of like the financial crisis, 2008, 2009. And by around 2011, Occupy Wall Street was really gaining steam. And there were some high profile sort of like hacks that happened with the, you know, the PlayStation hack and the stuff that Julian Assange was doing uh, in Europe. And people were turning to technology sort of like to fight the power, right? Uh, and that's, I think, what really, you know, I was in college, I was a senior in, in 2013. Uh, and that's what really sort of the reason I gravitated to crypto, right? I, I kind of wanted to use technology to, you know, sort of bring um, about change, right? Or sort of that revolution that I, I think a lot of young people are, are interested in seeing. And I really thought that, hey, technology was, like this new tech was the way to sort of get there. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think no, no one could really foresee what it is today and, and sort of the involvement the symbiotic involvement with the global uh, economy. No, and I appreciate that. And I think that's very interesting because I think a lot of people, and I would say a lot of people, majority of the people didn't know about these kind of things. And I, I can guarantee you now, no one believed what it would be what it is today. But you did touch on something that I think is of relevance is that you speak about how technology is creating opportunities and how it's actually for the betterment of you know, you, um, for civilization. I think there's a lot of people that would argue that, but I'm also on the same opinion as you that I think it, it actually helps people more than it actually does um, do damage. And I suppose that's a subject that we can have for another day. But one of the things I also wanted to talk about is obviously when you had joined Bitcoin Magazine, uh, Vitalik Buterin, who's the founder of Ethereum, he was very involved in, you worked underneath him. Can you tell me how it was at the time when you worked underneath this gentleman? I've, I've, I think I've watched enough YouTube videos to know he's some form of a genius. Take us through that experience and I think it shed some light on that. I know a lot of people watching this want to hear this story. 
Yeah, yeah. So Vitalik is younger than me, right? He was a sophomore when I was a senior. And, uh, you know, he was just the most vocal uh, in writing uh, person in the early Bitcoin community, right? So pretty much everything only online happened at a Bitcoin talk forum, which is still in existence, but I guess not that popular anymore. And pretty much everything was about Bitcoin. And so Vitalik founded the, the magazine in 2011, I believe. And I joined in 2013. And at that time, I mean, we were the only sort of uh, physical print magazine. Uh, you know, we reviewed all of the projects in, throughout Bitcoin, the Bitcoin community globally. And uh, it was a pretty great team. I mean, there were a lot of exciting things happening. 2013, uh, Bitcoin uh, started that year, I believe, probably around like $16, $18, right? So uh, for us, it was now sort of a little more serious, right? Uh, and uh, we oversaw, so what really, I think, changed the landscape was that year, ASIC miners first came onto the scene. And that was what really... Can you, can you just explain to everyone that's watching what an ASIC miner is? Yeah, so ASIC miner is a proprietary uh, device, right, that uses proprietary chips to exclusively hash the algorithm that secures the Bitcoin network, right, the 256 SHA. Um, and so before, what people were using were like uh, your local, uh, your general uh, CPUs or GPUs, right, graphics cards, uh, which are kind of like an all-in-one uh, device that can do computations but aren't tailor-made to any particular computation. And so the ASIC miners were made with uh, solving uh, right uh, the Bitcoin blocks in mind. So they were just super fast. They were like unimaginably exponentially faster. And so that really is what, you know, when those machines started coming out, you saw the price evolve from, you know, the 20s into the hundreds. And by the time all the machines kind of came out in October, we were right past 300. I remember when Bitcoin went past 300 in October, that was a really, really big thing. And so in all of that, um, you know, I mean, there, you know, a lot of greed, a lot of speculation. And, um, I, you know, I think in the background, that's when Vitalik started coming up with, okay, well, you know, his, his sort of magnum opus where Ethereum was really supposed to be sort of like the OS of blockchain, right? right? That's like, was kind of like what he really wanted to do. And so there was a lot of moving parts, right? He had to make, make his own sort of scripting language. So he felt, right, uh, and put together sort of a, a lot of different projects that were already in the space, right? And so he took from like pieces from MasterCoin, pieces from ColorCoin, uh, uh, Counterparty, right? All of those things were sort of put together into what uh, Ethereum was. And we uh, released the research in a six page spread in the magazine. Uh, and that was that. That was the beginning of everything. Wow. I mean, uh, for me, it's, it's it's fascinating because I've never really interviewed anyone that is so early on with the, the vast experience and knowledge that you have, and, and especially obviously working with people that are staking a claim in this space and are very well known, like Vitalik. So I mean, that's incredible. And uh, the last thing I want to ask you before we get into Moment NFT uh, NFT is. Obviously, this whole Ethereum merge that everyone is well aware of, everyone's reading up, and I think there's a lot of anticipation to see how this is actually going to pan out, myself included. And just so everyone that is watching knows that Ethereum's plan to merge is going to trigger what they call a triple halving event. And this is something that is well known on Bitcoin when we have these halving events, but now with Ethereum, it's going to be a triple a triple halving event, which is obviously something interesting. And I think very much worth worthy of talking. So with this upgrade soon to trigger, there will be a massive price rally. I would imagine, um, Julian, making Ethereum potentially one of the largest cryptocurrencies. What is your take on that whole uh, on the whole concept? Yeah, I mean, I think the the general community is extremely excited about this, right? Uh, it galvanizes all of crypto, right? It's not just like people who are into Ethereum or, or you know, into sort of EVM chains, it, it's the, the larger market as a whole. So I do think, right, like, again, we're, we're in a total different, I think, world where now finance and big institutional investors are have a seat at the table. And so they are definitely very excited about this. So, yeah, I would definitely say you can expect uh, Ethereum to surge in price. And this will probably be a catalyst to bring uh, crypto uh, 
maybe not to the peaks that we saw a couple months ago, but definitely an increase o overall across the board. Uh, there are also a lot of other projects that are sort of, you know, been uh, uh, sort of building up in the past couple months, Solana, Algorand, uh, sort of projects like that. And you're going to see a lot of them fill in the gaps as well, right? And so I guess, yeah, I mean, for a short answer, more money will definitely be flowing into crypto, specifically into Ethereum, um, right? I mean, the, the president is there. Yeah, no, I think I'm, I'm, I'm of the same sentiments. And also because sports find our NFT marketplace is built on the Ethereum blockchain. And I think naturally with all these conversations and what's currently happened, well, not currently really, over the last six months with the, the crypto and NFT winter, as people are talking about and the various crashes and the ridiculing of cryptocurrency where the people like ourselves very much know we will have the last laugh. So uh, I did want to obviously um, segue now into Moment NFT. And this is obviously, from what I understand, the most recent project that you are spearheading. You are the founder and CEO. For people that don't know anything about Moment NFT, please just take us through how it came about, what you guys are doing, and then I have a few more questions that I have laid out for you. Yeah, so I mean, I, I was extremely fortunate to work with Vitalik, right, in that early time. And and specifically at the magazine covering all these other projects. And, um, you know, I think it was just really just learning. I mean, I'd say about 90% of all the projects that exist today did actually exist in 2013. There are very few things that are new. And, and, and some of the, most of the things that are new are in specifically in the DeFi space, because DeFi just didn't exist before. But most of the things related to, uh, right, so like POS systems, uh, sort of marketplaces, um, not NFTs the way that they exist today, but just general digital ownership um, were there. What people used to focus on was onboarding into a, you know, live on crypto all the time kind of lifestyle, right? Where you really didn't want money, you wanted crypto, right? Now um, it's definitely, crypto is being used as a tool to increase the amount of dollars that you have. Right. And so there's just more focus in that direction. And so I, I think it just really became obvious to me that, right, uh, the space was missing sort of that bridge between the fiat world and, and crypto. And really, right in 2020, um, right, the creator economy was here in full swing. Right. I don't know anybody who wasn't spending like four hours a day on TikTok. Right. It just TikTok just took over and short form video became even more obvious. Right. I, I, I had Vine, I downloaded Vine, but it kind of just wasn't sticking. It really wasn't there. And Facebook video always was a horrible product, right? But then we kind of started living on, off YouTube. Our YouTube channels became the thing, and we really followed a content creator and sort of watched them. But even on YouTube, the problem there was these content creators took about like three to four years to build up their audience, right? And so what we saw with TikTok was just an incredible, right? Like just giving all the leverage to content creators, Right. And so uh, between hearing sort of stuff from like Mark Cuban at the time and Gary Vee, it seemed to be really clear that there was something happening. There was a missing piece here in the creator economy and digital ownership. And so um, I set out to really create a platform that can help creators monetize their content uh, and help fans, super fans, um, get closer to the people who inspire them. Right. Because like the, the real actual big problem is that we we think of social media just as one paradigm, right? We've kind of been gaslit into believing that social media is all about, you know, putting up content for likes, right? Likes and views, uh, so that another company could come and run ads against your attention, right? Like, and that's it. Like, that's all we've been doing the past 15 years. And so today, social media doesn't really, uh, it, it doesn't cover the grand majority of how humans interact, right? So we don't just do things for, like, general attention, right? We do things because we're inspired to do things or we're inspired by other people or we want to generally share and evangelize things. And a lot of that is missing because again, the point of social media so far is really just to run ads. Uh, and so now with NFTs, with crypto um, and blockchain, you're able to take ownership over that content and sort of sell it really or price it one-to-one, -one, right? This is more of, of like, a, you can even think about this as a content as an asset class, right? That's sort of where we're moving. And we built these these, these tools uh, to foster the creator economy and, the, and and those creators, right? 
Um, so essentially, we're, we're kind of like the TikTok for Web3. And um, yeah, we've, we've, we've had a lot of growth. A lot of people are really digging it, um, right? I, I think the, the fortunate thing for us is from day one, this is really a global approach, right? Like Facebook, uh, Instagram, Snapchat, they really weren't global or even thought about global until maybe like three or five years down the line. They didn't really have to. The world didn't operate that way. But today in 2022, especially with uh, blockchain, things are global immediately. Yeah. Right. Uh, whether it's people it, it obsessed with Axie Infinity in Philippines or uh, right uh, other startups sort of in other sort of like Indonesia, Singapore, et cetera. This really gives the opportunity for for us to create opportunities globally. And that's what we're seeing in the creator economy. We have some some surprising ecosystems that are are producing incredible content that is extremely valuable to them. Right. So, for example, if a if a content creator in a third world country creates content and sells it for five dollars, it sounds like it's nothing to us. But that's a big deal yeah. where they're from. I, I mean, I come from South Africa, and the exchange rate I can really tell you that five dollars will go a long way in countries like South Africa or most African or East Asian uh, countries. Right. No, a hundred percent. And so Hollywood has never expanded outside of the U.S. and even YouTube. Right? There's no like YouTube studios that reach these third world countries. And so all they have, and they're experimenting ardently with TikTok. That's what's, that's what fueled the growth, right? Uh, but unfortunately, all they can get is likes on TikTok. You can't eat likes, right? And so well, you, can't pay your rent, you can't pay your rent with likes, I suppose. Right, right. Mm. right. And so now we're opening this up to the actual commercialization of this content on a global scale, right? Like we don't, we don't, we don't have anybody sort of like uh, dictating what it is that we do, right? So we don't have a mandate to, hey, you know, just cater to this demographic because we're only running ads to this demographic, right? We, we're opening this marketplace to everyone. Yeah, it, I mean, like, it sounds like, and from what I've read, it's almost like decentralizing this Hollywood model in which you refer to effectively. And I think it's, it's, it's so funny that I'm having you on today. My, my co-host is normally on the show with me, John. Now we've had this conversation of how NFTs and how Web3 is going to allow people, particularly in these underprivileged countries or these countries with um, very tough um, history, how they can now actually monetize uh, and create a revenue stream to support their families from their computer or from their, their smartphone device. So now obviously you've been, you've been working on this and you say you got the traction that is obviously surprising you. With Sports Finder now, we're obviously very much focused on um, NFTs in the sports world, dedicated NFT marketplace for athletes to help them actually monetize and leverage their NIL, which is, I'm sure it's something that you're very well aware of. With, with Moment NFT, where do you see majority of the creators coming from? Like what kind of field? Do you see opportunity for young sports athletes in the, the high school or collegiate space finding ways in which they can generate in, in, uh, revenue for their NIL? I'd love to hear your take on that. So I'm smiling because, you know, so our, our head of biz dev, Michael Hess, he, this is his, this is his main goal, you know, uh, you know, dream project where he is working with uh, youth athletics, uh, in high school and college, uh, not only around the NIL, but even around their announcements and obviously building their personal brand. Right. And we've seen in the NBA zone, um, a lot of those professional athletes are super open and interested, right? So for example, we have Jalen Suggs uh, producing exclusive content on, on our platform now. Uh, he's an NBA player. We have Juju Smith-Schuster. He's a professional NFL player. And we're in talks with, uh, we're, so we're in talks with a couple of groups. I, I don't want to make it public. I'll, I'll leave that That's for the fine. drop. That's fine. That's uh, coming up. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I think, Athletes are one of the, those de that demographic group that inf inspires, I think, the most amount of passionate fans, right? And so the opportunity here for uh, collegiate uh, or high school athletes to really brand themselves and capitalize or price their personal brands uh, is something that we're targeting, right? And something that's just never been possible before. I mean, before you pretty much had the behest of maybe an agent or right that sort of corporate sponsor that is taking the lion share and pricing you now you have another valid uh a data point 
backed by actual dollars to say, no, you know what? I'm actually worth this, right? My audience is immediately monetizable in this, you know, gross sum, right? This is something that people have never had before. So yeah, we're, we're, we're going specifically after that vertical. I feel like we can have many interesting conversations in Julian. I mean, there's so much opportunity and there's something that I also want to get into is the utility behind the NFTs, right? Because we're in a, in a stage where you speak to maybe 90 to 95% of people, they think they know what NFTs are or they have heard of it, but a lot of people are naturally skeptical. We're in this, this what I would call the dot-com boom when it comes to now Web3. We find in a lot of these companies that came up and uh, rose to the top last year, a lot of them had fall, uh, fallen, and I think we've weeded out a lot of these, these phony NFT collections, these projects, and. I think um, it's the, the the industry now is predominantly being spearheaded by these large organizations and these sporting organizations, which we find in the sports find is that we find that the sports um, arena, the, the athletes, the organizations involved, they all form part of this ecosystem are helping drive the NFTs. So obviously when it comes to merchandising, fan experiences, and the, one of the main things that we have to now educate not only our audience on, but the fans and the athletes themselves is how the utility of an NFT is so different to what you actually think it is. What are your thoughts on that? And how do you think athletes can actually leverage NFTs to offer utility to their fans and their audience that are effectively supporting them and will be the ones that will be buying the NFTs? Yeah, so I definitely think people are going to go after that genuine connection that I mentioned before has been lacking from the internet as a whole, right? We don't really distinguish particularly between Web 2 and Web 3 simply because we really feel like we're building a suite of tools that leapfrogs, like this stuff has, a true fandom platform has never existed on the internet. Right? There's no way for really that level of interaction, right? It's really just polished and edited images thrown up, again, for advertising purposes, for writing ads. And so I think that when you're thinking about launching an NFT project, the utility should be something that resonates with you and your direct community, right? Like, you know your fans better than anyone else because essentially you play, if you're, if you're an athlete, you play for them, right? These are home team fans. These are, are fans that are interested in your sport, right? Uh, and you guys uh, share a lot in common, um, even though, you know, you are the athlete and they're sort of the fan. And so we leave it up to the creator to decide the level of interaction, right? We do coach them and give them examples of what we've seen have, has worked in the past on our platform. We definitely have a, a ton of success stories there. Um, but you can imagine, right? I mean, we, we separate it between sort of digital uh, utility, right? Digital first utility and then physical utility. So digital would be anything like a, like an, uh, a live stream, right? Uh, or digital collectible uh, where a physical sort of utility would be an actual meet and greet, a uh, physical piece of memorabilia, right? Event tickets and passes. And you see some some music artists are experimenting with that. I don't know if you've seen like a Chris Brown, he's, he's on tour, right? He broke the internet with a thousand dollar sort of VIP passes. Uh, and so we're moving in a direction where we want to make sure that these aren't just one-off experiments. These happen cohesively and get the, the most distribution possible. Right, it hits all of your fan base sort of effortlessly. Right, cool. You you proved yourself. You got the likes on TikTok and on Instagram. Now communicate with that community. Right, sell directly into that community. Reach out to them and and have these in person experiences that people will value. Right, like humans have been paying for real life experiences since the beginning of time. Yeah. Right? yeah. So that, we want to put that all together in one place. And the, the last thing that I would ask you uh, before we end off is, because I know we're restricted for time, is the education around NFTs and helping the athletes educate their audience. What are, uh, what are some of the, the tips or pointers you would actually maybe help an athlete to do? Because what we find is obviously an athlete is dedicated to training every single day, so their time is very limited. But the success of the NFT collection will be determined on how they push us through their social media channels. What do you see working the best and what do you think is the most effective way of doing this? I think trust is the biggest factor, right? We're just in a range where people are very doubtful, uh, very worried about scams and, and, you know, where does my money really go, right? So I think trust and transparency is really important. So what that means is not only you building your personal brand around this, but then also uh, aligning yourself 
with the partners that can be trusted in the ecosystem as well, right? Uh, and we saw a lot of influencers in the past, non-athletic influencers fail uh, in, in a wild fashion with this, right? Where they just kind of launch something out with a couple scammers and expose their audience to that, right? An athlete has a much higher profile uh, that they need to protect. And I think it's on them to really work with trusted platforms, right? Uh, don't want to seem sort of too self-serving, but obviously Memento is that solution to, to, to help do that. Um, but yeah, I think I think trust trust is paramount. Um, and then I would just say authentic, authenticity, right? They really need to know that this is something that you're into, right? I would say never throw out an NFT just because it's another revenue opportunity. Um, those projects will do will never do as well as anything else, right? I would say if you're going to do this, take this seriously, um, right? Be authentic, uh, create moments that you really would want to share with your fan base because you're directly communicating with your fan base. And this is this stuff is on chain, so it kind of exists forever, right? People will always remember you by this content that you're putting out. Um, and, you know, and so I think the third thing then would, um, I think for me, be even try to, right, this gives you an opportunity to employ people within your fan base. These NFTs will be resold, right? They'll be also talking about you and building up your personal brand, right? So whether, like, now you have the opportunity to have your own chief marketing officer, right? Uh, and or influencers will grow up around you, right? Because you're an athlete, you're going to spend most of your time on the field, right? Um, playing the sport. Now, there will be influencers that grow up to protect or gatekeep your brand. What we used to see were uh, people who ran fan clubs. There was always, like, the, the leader or the head of the fan club. Now, through NFTs and on Momento, you get that experience back again, right? Somebody will be uh, promoting your content, helping you to make content, or making content for you, right, uh, where most of the value goes directly to you. Right, so we're empowering all of those synergies. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not too sure uh, what other platform probably does that. I think. Uh, I doubt if any. Uh, you know, because again, I, I just. I think the fundamental problem is people have not thought about fandom in it in a real genuine way. I think they're always sort of thinking of it as like, how can we just sell something, or how can we run ads? And uh, that's not what we're trying to do here. In Momentum. I, I completely agree with you and I think you've said something so crucial and I think it's overlooked by the organization and the athletes themselves, the importance and the, the re, their reliance on fans because I think, I'll give you a good example, I don't, I don't know how up to speed you are with, uh, with English soccer or football, right? there's Manchester United and they are in uh, disarray at the moment where there's this complete disconnect between the football club, the athletes and the fans where there's this almost waging war going on between them um, indirectly via social media. And it's because the brands and the athletes just generally don't know what their fans and their audience wants and they're not being authentic in that. And I think if they were to follow the route of doing an NFT collection or drop all these fan experiences, it's going to take a lot of convincing and trust, as you've said, to get these fans on board. And I think it's important for the athletes to actually be mindful of this because, yes, you are able to generate a new form of revenue. But in order for that to be successful, you have to come to the party as well. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I think um, I think we're talking about probably a larger systemic global problem, right? When people talk about the toxicity of social media, it might just really be this, right? It might just be, you know, social media, unfortunately, has made all of us less and less authentic, less and less real with each other, right? Yeah. And we're just in the process of getting out of that, right? Like breaking, breaking away from that. Um, but yeah, I think right. This is the best time to to step forward and, and think about these things. And I think together we can all come up with a better idea of how it is that we relate, right? And and I love I love your insights on 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 on, on football on, on European football. Um, I suspect there's a lot we could do there. So, uh, they, they, uh, but uh, how much time do you have, by the way, Julian? How much time do you have left? um yeah we're, we're good on time for All me right. it's, it's you know i'm in new york so okay no, that's cool then I, I mean I'm, I'm more than happy to have this conversation i'm thoroughly enjoying it so to your point with this opportunity in english football I, i'm an avid fan and i am very ingrained in the sport in the football world with regards to fan engagement fan channels and the likes 
and actually I, I, I observed this differentiation between the, the media and the fans. And the media are trying to portray an image of an individual, of a, a club, completely different to what the fans perceive it as. And there's this complete um, disengagement or gap, which it sounds like with moments NFT is trying to bridge together, which I love. And I think, speaking to your point of the opportunity there, football fans in the UK and in Europe, and I mean like other countries like Latin America, Argentina and the likes, it's a religion there. So if they yeah. can find ways in which they can in, in, engage further with the athletes in which they idolize, that is a great opportunity for companies like Moment NFT, like Sports Finder, to actually get involved and offer the fans an experience in which they've never had before. Yes. No, you're you're 100 percent right. I mean, th those are the type of experiences that we're trying to target. We're, we're trying to laser focus on that. And where do you, where do you see like Moment NFT going like in the next five years? Like, how do you envision this the, the this company? Where do you want to see it going? Yeah, I mean, hopefully, right. I mean, the idea was always to put crypto in everyone's wallet. That's why we're a mobile app, right? We want it right there on your phone. We want it to sort of right just you have complete ownership over all your sort of digital tokens, NFTs, and everything from one place. Um, because it's a collection of the experiences that inspire you. Um, ideally in five years, I, I mean, I'd love to put this in a billion pockets, uh, right? I think that that's, that's, that's my major goal. But I mean, for everyone, every content creator, you know, whether it be in third world countries uh, or athletes, uh, we would like to see them preserve their moments in an authentic way that they can get out to their fans. I mean, that's, that's, that's just really, you know, I, uh, and I'll, yeah, I'll give you, I guess, a really quick story. When I was young, I won a Reggie Miller signed poster. He was a, he was a basketball player. Massive, yeah, massive. And um, I wasn't even a Reggie Miller fan. I wasn't a Pacers fan. I didn't really even like basketball. I was more of a baseball guy. But when this thing got to my house, I put it up on my wall. I started looking up to him. And, uh, you know, I'm a impressionable young sort of person. I really, really looked up to this guy and I had a connection with somebody who, imagine, I didn't even know how his voice sounded. I didn't know anything about him, but it was this thing about him uh, that made me sort of feel like I wanted to be number one, right? Because, you know, he's, you know, it's a poster, right? Yeah, him, we, sure. all, we all had posters growing up or whatever. Like I remember growing up, I, I think like David Beckham, whatever it was at that age when I was playing football. Yeah, yeah. So I, look, I, I think that that never, I think that that never goes away. I think that all humans look up to other humans that are leaders in the industry that maybe they are in or in sports or in music. I mean, we all consume music, right? Uh, that's something fundamental that makes us humans. And so I'm trying to build just this, a, a scalable solution for that globally, right? Um, the tool set is there. Um, right. We think that it could be distributed pretty quickly, uh, and just have people, right. I mean, everything, whether, uh, the type of content, the pricing of the content is all up to the creators. We don't manage any of that. Right. And so we're definitely more hands off. And I think crypto allows us that business model that enables us to be hands off, right. And really give this out to creators, right. Because uh, no matter what Silicon Valley tech startups say, there is no way that they can be hands on, right? Their business models dictate that they must do certain things to their user base and their, you know, customers uh, in order to continue. Uh, we don't have any of those constraints. You know what I'd be interested to see is with your platform, creating exposure for content creators in parts in the world that maybe you would never actually see that kind of content because that access has never been provided before. Yes, some could argue that social media may have allowed for that, but I think it's just a, a subject that we can debate about back and forth. Do you do you see Moment NFT helping underprivileged people, or how do you, like how do you see it adding the most value? Because it seems like you have this vision, you have this drive to help people that maybe would not normally have opportunities to sell their content or actually monetize their creative side or their skills and their talents. Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. So we're seeing it right now. It happens right now, uh, every day on Memento. Uh, particularly, I'm not gonna mention sort of, I guess from which country, but particularly we have, uh, it started off with just one creator. And this guy 
his content is incredible. I mean, this thing, this stuff seems like, you know, some somebody from like San Francisco who happened to travel abroad and put all this stuff together uh, and then bring it back. And like, you know, we will all discover it. But uh, no, I mean, he, he's a local person and uh, he has made a significant amount of money uh, with us month over month. And uh, now he's involving other people in his community. And, uh, you know, that, it, it, it was hard that. for us to get his first payment to him. Uh, we just didn't, we didn't think that it was going to take off in that direction. We thought we we're just going to be sending money to people in the United States. Right. And uh, I remember right before sending it, we looked up the address on Google Maps and it's a super rural place. Right. Um, what did he sell? And, what was the NFTs? Uh, so his NFTs, like I said, they're, they're, so we do short form videos, so they're yeah. short form videos, but they're just, it's just the, the perfect music, the perfect shoot. They're, they're basically sceneries. It's like a point of view in his life. Fantastic. Right. But like, they, they're, they're kind of like, like, that's what I was saying. It's like, if, if somebody would have went out and discovered this beautiful paradise and then come back and told everybody, like, hey, man, this is what Earth is really like, right? The kind of stuff you just kind of don't see. He has a lot of that kind of content. And a lot of introspective content, right? Him thinking about sort of larger things. Like, he's very clearly a very smart guy. Um, and it's like you said, right? Like, there are probably hundreds, thousands of people sprinkled all around the world who just haven't had the opportunity to share their insights, right? And globally, maybe their perspectives are thought of as lesser simply because they're not part of the, the machine, right? Um, we, we, and now we, we're, I, we're able to go to I have an idea. I think if uh, next time we do record again, I hope we do get to record again, is maybe we bring one of these individuals onto the podcast and actually ask them how their experience was because that'll be a perfect user case and showcase for Memento NFT. And just so everyone that is watching knows, we'll put the link for Memento NFT in the description and it'll be available on our uh, YouTube channel as well as on our podcast channels. But I, I think that would be a brilliant idea. And are you guys actually maybe communicating with these people that you're paying and your first, your, your first people? What is some of the feedback that you've got from them? Yeah, I think they were surprised that it's this easy to, to make money with content, right? Because when you compare Apple to Apple to the other options, right? TikTok right now, I think, is paying you something like $10 for like 12 million views. Right, so like that is mad. You get what I'm saying? So like it just it's just not comparable. So I think that they're just really surprised. It's like wow, like this is actually happening, right? And there are many reasons why people will buy NFTs, right? They they can either be supporting you, interested in some of the utility maybe you attach, just really just kind of like your content, or just want to collect NFTs, right? I think a significant amount of early adopters right now on our platform want to collect NFTs for future resale, right? So uh, we're literally opening people up to a brand new economy uh, and just letting the creative people be creative. That's all we want from creators. We want them to be creative because I'm not particularly a creative person. So I admire right, the incredible things that they do. Uh, so we just wanted them to keep creating. Well, I mean, I think that's, uh, I could argue that, that you probably are a creative individual for coming up with this idea and actually spearheading it. I think creativity gets lost in the, the art of actual design and what you actually see, but not actually the execution. So I'm much the same, so I can definitely relate to that. So uh, um, Julian, before we come to an end, is there anything that you would love to ha have the audience know about Memento NFT, any asks that you have, any opportunities in which you guys are hiring for anything? The floor is yours. Yeah, uh, please download, sign up, check it out, right? Support sort of a, a lot of these micro creators, um, right? And share with your friends if you like anything you see. Um, you're also more than welcome to apply to be a creator. We'll check you out. And, uh, you know, we're opening up applications now. Um, pretty much we want to see the community, right? We want to give everyone an opportunity to, to become a creator. And, uh, yeah, I mean, right, if, if, if you really feel like their content should be seen, uh, we can even make you a feature creator and make sure that, you know, you get those eyeballs. Fantastic. Well, Julian, I can't thank you enough for your time. I mean, I, I really hope that we can arrange another one, a follow-up one in the, in the next few weeks or months, just to see how far Memento NFT has come and to potentially see if there's any form of collaboration between Sports Finder and Memento, which it sounds like there may be. I'm more, I'm more, I'm more interested to see how the athletes are doing in your platform, and that's just my normal bias. 
But that, that is coming to the end. Everyone, thank you so much for listening. Please like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are growing week on week, and we have an amazing guest like we have today with Julian. And I can't wait to see where you take Memento NFT, and hopefully we get to chat soon. Take care, Julian. Awesome, mate. Take care. Okay.